Hello, 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 everybody. Let's do this midnight live right. Cheers to anyone drinking some coffee, because I guess it's more like afternoon, early evening in the States, and then maybe morning in parts of Asia and Australia and Europe. Sorry if you're up. You're up with me, and we're doing this together. All right. Drinking decaf, don't you worry. Um, so I just posted two videos back to back in the past week uh, on distribution tools and, uh, you know, let the data kind of speak for itself. And there's been a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of questions, which is understandable. There's some implications from the results that could have far reaching conclusions, could kind of shake up, no pun intended, the way we kind of view puck preparation. So I was going to go through some of the more common questions I've been seeing and kind of answer them the way I would answer them. Uh, if something is a significant answer or something that is absolutely without a doubt provable, uh, I will note that. Otherwise, I'm giving you my thoughts based off of my testing and my own observations and what I think makes sense. So uh, yeah, to start off, I do want to address the elephant in the room, which is just taking like a shaking you know, something like this that comes with a grinder, a doser, um, you know, something that comes like with your DF64, with the Zerno, whatever. Taking your grinds, put it in your portafilter, shaking it, lifting it. Is that going to replicate exactly what I'm using with this tumbler? Which I'm going to say this again. I've said this in every form I can find. There's no imperative to get the Weber tumbler. It's, I got it with my EG1. It comes with an EG1. It's the one I already had. I wanted to include a blind tumbler. Why would I buy another one when I have a perfectly good one at home anyway? So there's no imperative to get the Weber branded one. Um, anyway, um, so yes, is it doing the same thing? Well, as far as shaking, sure. Now, I, I mean, I, I can't speak to if this little plug inside with the rod, if that's facilitating in some of the shaking and breaking. I don't know, shake and bake, I don't know. Uh, but what I can say is I would assume the shaking is somewhat similar to just shaking grounds, right? That's one of the big uh, advantages of this is the actual act of shaking, okay? That's what's going to cause the grounds to um, potentially lose some of its static depending on the material of your dose cup. But it's also going to help with that kind of potential diffusion we're talking about where fines might be entering pores of other grounds, which you can see the effects of both in the faster shots that were pretty significant in my test, but you can do this at home very easily. You don't even need an espresso machine. Do it with pour over. Do like in three days in a row, use the same grind size on the same coffee, or sorry, maybe you should do six days in a row. Use a coffee every day. This way you don't have to shove it all in one day. And then day one, Shake the grounds for like 10 seconds before you put it in and brew. Day two, don't do that. Day three, do it. Day four, don't. And then so on and so forth. And then you, I'm, what you'll see is actually a pretty big variation in time. Uh, the faster times being in one with shaking grounds. A lot of you have already reported trying this. Uh, and it's something I do plan to look more into. It's something I've already got some preliminary results on. But shaking does speed up the drawdown. And it seems to be because of that fine kind of diffusion thing that's going on, which is kind of confusing. But uh, that's something anyone can try out at home. You can do it with espresso as well, of course. Um, and it seems that the more you shake, there are marginal increases in speed, uh, but it, it slows down. Like the first bit of shaking kind of does the majority of that increase in speed. So it's kind of like extraction where extraction goes kind of quick and slows down. It seems that is the same thing, similar, like uh, the same trajectory going on with shaking. But whenever you're using a cup like this and you're going direct to port filter and you lift, you're probably going to have really wonky distribution in that bottom of the basket, which is what I've been talking about with, which is the kind of the, the downfall of direct to port filter is it's, it's kind of choosing an area where it's going to over concentrate. So if you do shake it, maybe do some light WDT in order to redistribute horizontally a bit. The thing that is so uh, advantageous about something like this that has a plug, something like the blind shaker that has a plug in it, is when you lift the plug, because this slot down here has angles that are feeding it and it's polished on the inside, the grounds just slide sort of in the center and then mound outwards. And so it gives you a nicer distribution. So with a simple tap, you have a pretty level bed. But whenever you're just going straight from a doser into the basket, it's not going to be nearly that level. And it will likely cause for a little bit of extra polishing. Now, I want to make sure that people do not read my, read my results as WDT is dead. You know, uh, that's that's some, you know, meme -y things I've been seeing going around. WDT is still obviously very, very helpful. And Yes, horizontal tapping performed almost as well or as well statistically as WDT, but you have to remember, 
I'm very good at horizontal tapping, like weirdly good. I've trained, no joke, multiple hundreds, maybe it's over a thousand at this point, of baristas hands-on teaching tapping. And I've yet to run into anyone that was as meticulous and like skilled at it as me. That sounds really big headed and really douchey, but it's it's the truth. For whatever reason, it's really hard for people to kind of understand how the grounds are going to bounce back. And so they'll be hitting it and it kind of lumps up on one side and they're just like, oh, it's fine. And then tamp, tamp. There's like ways of reading how the grounds are reacting in the basket in order to get it really level. And so I was doing that in a very careful way in that testing. And so I, in the same way that WDT has a big curve, a learning curve, that has a huge learning curve as well. So I think I think it's probably a shorter learning curve with WDT if you have the proper technique than it is with horizontal tapping. That being said, horizontal tapping is a very valid way of doing it. That also all being said, people see those extraction numbers and see that they're similar between horizontal tapping and WDT. And they think same extraction, same coffee. Extraction yield doesn't tell us much of anything. It tells us the amount that's been extracted. It doesn't say what has been extracted. Those two shots could be filled with completely different compounds. One of them could have been 26% around the edge and like 17% in the center. The other one could be more even 20 throughout. There's no way of really knowing that without doing more experimentation. Uh, so I want you to understand that even with these numbers, we're, uh, the extraction yield doesn't say too much. I relied on that. And this is leading into my next thing about taste. I relied on extraction yield because to me it seemed uh, it seemed to stand to reason that if with all things being held constant, if time was not a factor and we could get a higher extraction, it would therefore mean that the extraction efficiency is more or is higher with whatever was extracting more in the same or less amount of time. Okay, so you can see where that logic is. It makes it makes sense. You have 18 grams in, 36 grams out in 20 seconds. Shot A does that exact recipe and extracts 19%. Shot B, exact recipe, and it extracts 21%. It would stand to reason that the 21%er had a more efficient extraction in order to hit that 21. Now, that's not necessarily true, but I think there is enough credence lended to it, especially with the consistency and all these things, that it is likely the case. And so... Um, now, to, to, to respond to the loads and loads of questions about did you blind taste, did you taste, did you taste, did you taste, that would not have been helpful in this scenario. Now, before you go, what? Yes, it would. Taste is most important. Yes, taste is most important. But doing that in this test would have been silly. It would have been, it, would, it wouldn't have made any sense. And let me explain why. So what we're doing with this is we're trying to optimize the recipe, or I'm sorry, that was the next word I was supposed to say. We're trying to optimize our workflow, our station, our approach to extraction in order to hit the right recipe for a really nice coffee. Now, I set the espresso extraction recipe to horizontal tapping. That was a control, it was just horizontal tapping. And so at that recipe, it do, that doesn't mean that the higher extracted one's gonna taste better because it's higher extracted. That wasn't the point of the, of the experiment was this one extracts higher. Therefore, better. Ergo, better. No, it's to say, okay, so with this one, this is where it's tasting good. I could go coarser with the tumbler because it was extracting so much higher. I could achieve the same extraction as the uh, that's horizontal tapping. I could get the same exact extraction as that by going coarser, and I can guarantee a more even flow. The coarser you go, the more even the flow. That's just how it works, people. Okay, so I could guarantee a more even flow, and it opens up a bit more window of opportunity with my extractions. All right, let me take a sip of my decaf because it's delish. And yeah, I shook the grounds for this. You better believe it. So, um, where was I going? Yeah, so I did. Uh, uh, there, they, I didn't see a point in over caffeinating by taste testing this because it wouldn't matter. You have to dial them all into themselves, like. Um, there's a reason so many cafes use the NCD and it's because it, it, it can make tasty espresso, but it's not going to make the same espresso with the same recipe as something else, right? It, it, it is causing a lot more uneven extraction, but you can make that taste good, right? So a taste test at the same recipe would have been, it would just confuse people. And so I want to go ahead and just make that clear. A taste, the taste tests are not always the answer. I understand the desire to say, well, taste <laughs> Excuse me, Lance. I watched this whole thing and I just heard dribble and I heard numbers. I heard extraction yield, TDS. I heard densification, blah, blah, blah. Where's the taste? Taste is the leader. I get it. Trust me. I know this, but it wouldn't have made sense. It doesn't make any sense to taste test two things when they're not dialed in to where they could be. The idea is to find out what these different dis distribution methods are offering so we can actually go into planning how to pull 
with some with some more knowledge. Like when we share recipes, we're not thinking of what distribution tool we're doing. It's like, yeah, what did you pull that coffee at? Oh yeah, I pulled it at 18 and 40 out on a, a extract mundo dose, you know, in 12 seconds. Okay, I'll do that. And one person WDTs, the other person shakes. They're going to be completely different extractions, different grind sizes. So the end cup's going to be way different, even if they're machine, water, and grinder are all the same. It's a whole other variable that we aren't paying attention to that I think should be paid attention to. So it is it is an important aspect of brewing that just hasn't been given its due. So that is one, that that is kind of, I guess, a long answer as to why I didn't taste test. A, I didn't want to die. Uh, even when you sip and spit, you're still ingesting a good bit of caffeine and tasting over 100 shots of espresso, probably ending up in the ER with heart, heart palpitations. Um, so yeah, I did not, did not taste them all. That would have been a little silly. I did do some every now and then, but like I said, what are you going to say? Oh yeah, the, the shaker tastes better than the WDT right now. That means nothing at all. It means nothing. It just means that, okay, maybe I should redial the shaker or maybe the WDT tastes worse. Maybe I should redial it. I could increase the extraction to match it, or I could go coarse or make a lower extraction. And maybe, maybe with a WDT 19% extraction with coffee A tastes better than 22% extraction with coffee A on the blind shaker. I don't know. And that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to get across is you're not going to magically say, all right, today I'm pulling this. Now I'm going to switch my distribution methods and it'll just automatically taste better because this method's better. That's not that how that works. What we're looking for are, are, are mostly is this these data points and what is actually happening. And I think I think all that I've done with my videos is open up the floodgates for people to be looking into this. I'm not trying to be some you know, uh, scientific savant on the cutting edge of bringing to the world a new view of X, Y, Z. No, what I'm trying to do is with these videos, I want to open people's minds to the possibility that what we know is not actually what we know or what we think we know. What we know is a dimple on a basketball, right? And so with this, it's also going to open up the floodgates on more innovation. I guarantee you right now, there are already a handful, if not a dozen manufacturers trying to figure out a way to optimize a, a, a blind shaker. I guarantee that. There is, I've already had people talking to me about it. No, I'm not kidding. One specific company that's quite big has already reached out to me to talk. That, and that's what I'm saying is people think, you know, people want to say that I'm pushing one thing or another, but what they're not realizing is me shining a light on this is actually going to cause a lot of competition and will make a lot cheaper products out there for people with a lot of different variations. And so it's... Um, it's going to be exciting to see what kind of comes from this, but this is not the end-all be-all. I think we kind of got really comfortable with WDT as the end-all be-all, as like this is the fix. Um, and so this kind of shook a lot of people when it was, and honestly, it shook me and it shook Gagne. It shook everyone I showed it to before posting. And, you know, I have to eat crow. I, I've been pushing this narrative of WDT is necessary. Like, I think I've even used that in a thumbnail or something. Like, honestly, I, I, I am happy to eat crow. Like, I will, I will, you know, I, I'm not too, I mean, I'm arrogant. I'm not too arrogant to say like, no, I was right then. I'm right now. No, like I did not do sufficient data collection in order to see that my horizontal tapping over multiple shots could rival WDT. If I would have done that, I would have known that maybe it's not the answer to everything. Right. So I think we just took some things for granted and no one was really willing to put in the time or the hours to extract any meaningful data outside of very, very subjective, you know, confirmation biased testing. Uh, which is easy, you know. If you have a if you have a type that you like, of course you're going to have confirmation bias. You're going to want to try to find the the cup that mirrors your beliefs. Anyway, okay. I don't know why why live chat is not working on my phone. Let me open it back up. There we go. All right. Okay, so um, I'm going to get to those, but there I have like a little list of things I wanted to address. Many questions on RDT. How would RDT affect this? So in my testing, I only did two squirts of RDT using my Weber uh, squirter. I don't know what you'll call them, a little spritzer, this little bad boy, um, which is not nearly enough to affect what we saw in the Hinden paper. So in that Hinden video I did on his paper on RDT, uh, you need uh, he says around 20 microliters per gram is when you start seeing the effects. Um, and I did not go anywhere near that. I probably did. 10 microliters or gram or even a little bit less. I can't remember the exact amount per squirt, but it's something like 0.042 or something. And so I wasn't getting anywhere near enough in order to see the effects of that. So um, that is not in this. And actually it, it, it 
Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to actually speculate any more on that. Like what would happen if we added the 20 microliters per gram or more up to 50 microliters a gram? I'm not going to speculate on that just because I've not done any testing on it. And I don't want something living on the web in perpetuity that could be way hideodorously incorrect uh, from my mouth. I don't want to be wrong, especially after this right. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, my tongue was drying out. Okay. So yeah, RDT, you know, it, it, the, the moisture could affect um, the grounds while shaking. I don't know. Like I said, that's just like complete speculation based off really nothing other than potential moisture in there. I don't know. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to briefly address that. I, I can't speak to that because I didn't want to add that other variable. I don't do enough RDT to affect extraction as we saw in the paper because there's no consistent way to measure water. Um, because we don't have hydrophobic dosing cups. So water's always going to stick into our doser. We don't have hydrophobic linings on the inside of a grinder. So it's going to stick on the walls of the grinder. We don't know how much is being stuck on the burrs or being taken, whatever it is. We can't be sure. And so replicating it when you're using that much water, even a little difference is going to cause a difference. And so I just don't like messing with that variable. Um, so I don't actually use that in my routine. I think it's a novel idea and I'm really excited about the science and that we have that in our fingertips. But as far as incorporating it into my routine, I simply don't. I just do enough to kind of reduce static and make it cleaner. Um, and maybe if there's a potential benefit to lessening the heat at, at, at fracture, that's cool too. Anyway, um, then something else I want to address is there have been a lot of people asking about WDTing with the shake. I think you can do that. I, I, I added some skepticism in my video saying that it could potentially undo some of the densification. So I wanted to address that briefly. Well, when we talk about densification, that's like in the, ne the Nestle capsules. They're densifying the coffee so more coffee can fit in a smaller pod, okay? So it's taking away the interstitial spaces between those grounds, et cetera. And so I do think that is something that is potentially helping the extraction. And we can see that with Matt Perger back in the day was pushing for nutation. He took it back and then he pushed it again. And he's currently at like, he thinks it is a good thing. But anyway, the idea is we're densifying those grounds as we're shaking it. Or you could think of the term compaction. We're compacting them in a way. And when we WDT, it can fluff it back up, which isn't, I, I can't prove is a bad thing. It just seems counterintuitive to what we're doing. Uh, that being said, I think that if you want the benefits of shaking, it's definitely going to be better to shake in WDT than to just WDT. I say definitely as if I have any proof of that, but you will at least get, uh, I'm assuming you will get that theoretical fines diffusion into the bigger grounds when you're shaking and there's no way WDT will unsettle that. What it would undo potentially is the compaction that you have already given those grounds. So if you want a WDT, have at it. Let me know the results. I just can't speak to it with any type of confidence. Um, so I would say do something like, you know, shake, 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 you know, shake it aggressively, whatever. You can open it. You can WDT in the shaker or you can drop it in and do some in the basket. I don't find that necessary uh, with, a, with a blind shaker. It may be if you're using the dose cup, shake, 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 then I would definitely be WDTing. I wouldn't be, you know, whisking it like crazy. I would be doing enough to really make sure that we have it redistributed and pretty even uh, and then just give it a nice solid tap and then a tamp and then we should be good. I think something else that people don't think about is you can WDT in your dose cup and that's going to help. OK, so if you have a clumpy grinder, you don't need to WDT in the basket. You can WDT in the dose cup. Shoo, 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 shoo. Do the aggressive WDT there if you're scared of clumps, then dump it in, level it off and tamp. Now, one thing that I'm not convinced of is that clumps affect extraction. I'm not convinced of that. I've never seen any data pushing that. I have talked about how clumps could be bad in the past, but honestly, that's just me not doing due diligence and looking at it myself. I just believed everything I had heard, which is not obviously a good thing. And this study specifically has forced me to question everything. I thought I was already questioning everything. Obviously, that's not true uh, because I don't know anything, it seems. So... I'm not positive clumps are a bad thing. And in fact, I used to teach they were not bad. Years ago, I would teach that to baristas because I I was at a coffee shop once. The first time I saw WDT in person, I was at a shop that's no longer there, but it was one of the one of the stores of Revelator, which was a chain. I don't know if they're still running, but it was in Chattanooga. I walked in and the guy was grinding on like a, a, a peak or something. And he took a toothpick and was breaking clumps. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm breaking clumps. They can affect extraction. Okay. Um, and then I remember I heard Matt Perger talking about how clumps are going to be destroyed by the tamper. It doesn't matter. So I started teaching that because it was, it was an easier excuse. And Perger was like the guy I listened to for everything uh, in the early days. Um, and so... I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm kind of going back to that. I'm not positive that these clumps or, or caked grounds 
really do skew extraction. They might. And the Hinden's paper can be read in the way, in that way that the electro clumps, as Daddy Hoff calls them, can, can cause that. But I'm not convinced that, A, all clumps are equal. Uh, I think, you know, Daddy Hoff did a good job of calling them electro clumps when he was talking about, because I think those are arguably smaller little clumps, as opposed to the visual clumps we see from grinders that cause clumping. <coughs> um but I, I don't know. I, I also don't have a grinder that clumps that badly, or maybe I do, and I just don't use it uh, or, or forgotten about it. But um, if you have a grinder that's making massively visible clumps, you can do that in the dosing cup instead of in the portafilter. Get all those clumps out, shake that bad boy, shake it, shake it, girl. Make sure you don't break it, girl, and then toss it in. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's kind of my ideas on WDT. I still think it's a very valid way of distributing. You're not silly if you're using WDT or an Autocomb or a Moonraker or an um Umacot. You're not silly. Um, th that works for your workflow. It works for your taste. Do it. That's the thing is a lot of people say, I don't care. I'm my, The way I do it tastes really good. He's not going to take that away from me. I'm not taking anything away from anybody, guys. I don't care how you do it. I'm just making, I'm just making videos and I'm producing data and I'm trying to further our understanding of how espresso extraction works as well as other various things in the coffee world. So make the espresso how you want. You don't want to shake. Don't shake. Okay. Don't shake. I don't care. You don't have to be the Kardashian clan shaking a salad. You ain't got to do that. Okay. Just like make your espresso and be happy. There's no need to like overreact and run to Reddit and say, oh, he's paid by Weber. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's silly. Okay. Need to slip a dignity cow. Next thing on the list was pour over, but I've already talked about it. I think you can test this at home very easily. Make sure you randomize it so you can randomize the noise. Um, other shakers already touched on that. You know, taking it, shaking it like this, shaking it on the portafilter. Just make sure once the distribution is in the basket, it is like a decent distribution. I already talked about higher EY. Does that necessarily equal better? No, higher EY does not necessarily equal better at all. It's just that's the approach. Uh, you see what is arguably more efficient. Then you can kind of play with that by messing with the other variables that are lower, ex lower extraction, but maybe increase evenness of extraction. You can play around with it. Um, because we've been taught finer is better for so long. Reddit says grind finer, and I just disagree with that. And I think that, um, you know, the turbo paper was the first signal of that. And I think this is just another one. Um, and then clumps versus caking. Whenever you're shaking, I've seen people say it produces clumps. No, it doesn't. It's producing caked grounds, which may not be good. I don't, I really don't think caked grounds are that bad. I had a lot of caked grounds in my testing and I, it did not cause issues for me at all. Um, another thing I wanted to say is I see people saying, Oh, I shook for my pour over and now my pour over is going faster. So I went finer and now it doesn't taste good. Why are you going finer? Let it go faster. As you saw in my experiment, my, my blind shaker shots were going four seconds or so faster than the average shots from everything else. And we're extracting higher. If I go finer in order to elongate the time, I'm going to get a really high extraction. I don't want that. It's going to start getting bitter and grody. That's not what I want. I want it to taste good. So maybe try a shorter pour over. Maybe it'll extract a lot more efficiently and it won't have as long a contact time. It won't be maybe, maybe some of those bitter notes you have on it will be gone. I don't know. It's worth a try. But I don't think you need to uh, grind finer to, to compensate for that time. Don't worry about the time. Time is largely a red herring. We're working on time based off of preconceived notions of how coffee should extract. And obviously in those notions did not include shaking. So we're kind of opening up a new Pandora's box. Am I right? Okay. Um, okay. And then last thing I was going to talk about, and then I'll turn to questions in the box from people on my Patreon. Uh, last thing is workflow. Been a lot of concerns about workflow. Um, and I get that, but I think it's quite easy. And I'm going to kind of show you just briefly. So what I do with, with, with my workflow with the DF64, when I use the blind shaker, is I took this little cutie from the DF64, which is a little collar kind of thing they give you with it. And I just set it right there. I don't know how well you can see that on the video, but I just set it on the little tray on the bottom. And then I just simply put my blind shaker right on top of it underneath the forks, just like that. I just hit go. It grinds directly in there. I just barely tap, 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 tap the bellows. Boom. Now they're all ready to go. I put the lid on. I would shake five, 10 seconds. It depends on what I'm going for. Shake it pretty vigorously. Kind of do a little, don't do that. Um, you don't know, always have to be a showman and do something silly on these. Um, anyway, don't do that. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, you shake it up, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake and bake. Um, and then this is the important part. Now, Weber, uh, that when it, that, so they're the ones who created this, by the way. I think they actually have the pat or the trademark for the term, like blind shaker or something. Um, 
So they did technically create this. And so they have their own way of doing it. So you might think, oh, they're the OGs. They may have the best way of doing it. I have, I personally, in my own testing, I found that uh, their way is not as good as my way. Uh, hello. So what they'll do, and it's valid, it makes sense, is they will put this on top, which it fits a 58 millimeter portafilter. Fits it quite nicely. They'll put it on top, and then I'm going to hold it like this. Then they'll take this out, do, 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 take it out like this, and they hold this, and they woo, do that little movement. And what it does is it swirls the grounds and kind of flattens them in there. And you can just tamp it. And it looks level. It looks great to the eye. But it was dipping my extractions compared to me taking a collar. Where's a funnel? Doom, 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 doom. Well, I'm going to use this even though it's not actually a funnel. Um, we're going to, you put it, I, I do it like this, and I hold it from like, I'll put this on the table. Whatever. I put it like on the table, essentially. And it's holding it right here. It's hard to like. Here, what do I? Like this right here. I'll put it like right there. And I'll let it free fall down into it. So it has some space, like Tetris. You have time for, for you to make a decision before you play the right shape. It has time to kind of decide where it wants to fall into. When you're doing it this closely, they kind of just fall in and it's, it's not a good time. They're not having a good time. They're crammed and they're mad. Um, and so I actually found high, uh, higher extractions and, um, it was honestly more consistent when I was doing it this way. Uh, granted, I don't have like a s massive sample to kind of prove this. It was, um, pulling shots, notice the trend. And I just went back to the way I was doing it. Cause it was more consistent readings, uh, in higher extractions. So, um, you can do it that way, you know, if you want one less step, but I, I just, I have my shot collar like I usually do. I put it right on there. I grind into the blind shaker. Take it, lit it, shake, dump it into the portafilter, take the funnel off, and I just tap and tamp. It's that easy. No WDT, none of that. I just tap and tamp. If you have a you know good grinder, if you want to, you can always WDT in here if you think there's clumps. Shaking could arguably get rid of some of the clumps. Um, arguably it could. You're also reducing static when you shake in something with this material. So maybe it opens a clump up, takes some of the static away that's holding the clump together, clump, clump less, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't like putting the blind shaker directly on the portafilter. I like to lift it and just let it fall into it from a, a little bit of a height. And that's it. Just one or two taps to level it a bit. Boom. Uh, Stefan Ribe from the Decent uh, Diaspora, he actually showed that a cinder mounded uh, puck actually can extract more than a, a perfectly leveled puck. So even if it's a little mounded, I don't think that's a huge deal. But anyway, uh, so that's one workflow. Another workflow, obviously, is going into your dose cup. So just putting this on the DF. You know, like so, putting it into the forks, grinding straight into it, taking this off, pour the filter, shake, 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 and you just sit there and shake it. Boom. Try to get it as even as possible. It's going to be shooting to one side. You'll just have to be prepared for it. Collar, WDT a bit, tap, tamp. Done. Um, so I wouldn't overcomplicate it. Um, I don't think there's a real need to overcomplicate this. The idea of this is to make it a little easier. Um, yeah. Uh, if you have really like if you have really fluffy grounds, I think that's going to be harder to make it. Um, it's like you have sand like grounds, and you have like fluffy grounds. And I guess that's more so less the grinder and more how fine you're grinding. If you're grinding really finely, it's going to be a lot harder to situate the grounds evenly into that basket than if you were to grind more coarsely. More coarsely, they're going to fall a little bit more homogeneously and, and easily. Yum. OK. All right, that was all I wanted to kind of discuss. So let's look at these. I kind of want to get done in 15. It's uh, 12.30 here, so let's 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 do that. Uh, I think I have an expert barista using the Tumblr SKUs the results to see Hugo use it. Well, Hugo's an expert barista as well, sorry to say. He's a AST certified and trains, uh, does barista courses in town. Um, but it, there, there is no, there's no, there's no skill to it. Literally, you're just shaking it. There's no skill to it. You're just shaking it. I promise you, no skill. And then whenever you're releasing it, you're literally, I tap this because some grounds will cake on the top lid. Tap it like that and literally get all that junk out. You're just ringing the bell for service and someone goes, Garçon, would you like a nice espresso? And you say, oui, oui, and you get it, okay? Um, uh, let's see. I don't know if I'm going Oh, the other thing I was going to talk about is people keep saying, is there a blind shaker for 54 mil or 49 mil? The shaker itself might be called 58 because it fits a 58. But if you're using a collar on your basket, I've used this for my 51 millimeter Cremina. OK, it, it doesn't matter because the plug is what really matters. This size doesn't matter at all. Right. So whenever you lift, this, the stream is much thinner. 
So like much thinner and actually kind of comes in like a cone. It kind of, because the insides are jutted out. So it doesn't fall straight down like this. So even if that base was 50, uh, what, even if this base, the opening was 54 mils or so, 53 mils, they're not falling out with the 53 mil diameter. They're falling out with a pretty small diameter. And the higher up you go, it gets more and more narrow to an extent. So you can actually use this for 54. You can use it for 51. I, like I said, I use it for my Carmina all the time. Um, so only, that's the only way I do some my Carmina is with this or with the magic tumbler. This one, because uh, I like to use my key sometimes, my key, my HG2 sometimes. And I use this. Easy. Goes straight into it. No questions asked. Um, would it work to grind directly into the portafilter and use the Swarx funnel cap to shape deliver similar results? Yeah, so so sort of. Grinding direct to portafilter and then putting a cap on it and then shaking it in that. There's going to be minimal air, uh, minimal space for it to really shake. Um, and uh, the basket's going to be hot, which could uh cause some voc loss uh, as you're exposing it to that hot temperature for a while unless it's a cold basket um but arguably i mean you'll see some of the benefit it's hard for me to know without testing it but um it should give you some of the benefit for sure as far as all of it i don't know just because there's a lot less room for it to be shaking this is really sharp inside of that port filter i don't like that that'll save a barista for sure um but yeah um, let's see. So if I need help, like lattes. And... Let's see. Okay. I got a question just by curiosity with all the science behind coffee nowadays is coffee still subjective. And do you believe coffee at home is better than at coffee shops? Coffee is still subjective. Absolutely. There are people who get so inundated with the science that they will go forward and make sure that their methodology of brewing a cup is as up to date scientifically as possible. And their coffee can taste like absolute poo poo. It doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it does matter. What we're doing is we're trying to blend taste, art and science in order to pursue uh, our personal perfection. For some people, like, as we know, art and romance and all these things can greatly influence your taste experience, right? So some people say they had their best espresso in their lives in Italy. I would argue that's some of the worst espresso I've had in my life, just to be honest. Um, but there are people who, you know, I, I even think they have decent tastes. Like, they drink specialty coffee or something, but they'll say they had the best espresso ever in Italy. And I'm like, no, you didn't. Like, that was that was because you were looking out at beautiful, you know, ruins and, you know, you were looking at this different culture than yours and you were romanticizing it, whatever. Birthplates of coffee or, or, or not of coffee, but of espresso. Um, so I, I, I would say that, it, you know, for some people, the science means more because they like being meticulous and that improves their taste experience. Other people prefer a more, uh, you know, emotional approach and that, you know, confirms their experience and makes it a little bit better. So it's always a mixture for people. I do think science is going to help because I do think over overall, the large majority allow emotion to dictate everything and then they enforce that on other people. And that's where I have a problem um, is when people enforce their emotional reactions or their emotional investments onto other people. That's when it's kind of silly. Um, but yeah. Was it decent, more consistent this time with the flow rate changes? Yes, it was a lot more consistent. Um, I did not use the stock Italian a nine bar shot. I did not use anything stock. And I, I, I did program last time as well, but this time I talked to Damien and, um, I did what he recommended essentially. Well, it was like both. He said, I said, I want to do high flow rate for the fill. And he was like, you should also do this um, stop by weight and continue kind of thing. So what I ended up doing is 12 grams a second for the fill. So I wanted the group, I wanted the puck to be saturated like that. And then once it hit one bar, I wanted it to kind of stay at one bar until there was a gram of coffee in the cup. Then once the scale detected a gram, shot up to nine bar, and then it was a flat nine profile. So essentially, it's giving you roughly what your nine bar machine gives you at home. Uh, there's not much difference at all, except maybe the fill rate. But um, I needed to be consistent. So with that, um, it, it definitely helped. It definitely helped with consistency a lot. Like the, the, the shots, you know, speak for themselves when you look at the consistency there. Would a lack of shaking maybe increase complexity? Not necessarily. A coffee could be at full complexity when it's evenly extracted at 19%. 
or it could have most complexity if it was stratified extracted at 19%. Who's to really say, I think coffee is way too complex to be able to say something like that. Uh, and so it's just kind of understanding what we have in our arsenal in order to perfect it, or not perfect it, but um, improve it for our personal tastes. This is a great question, uh, and it's something I was talking about with the manufacturer I, I, I alluded to in secret earlier. Was wondering about your message on EAF about WDT in the blind shaker prior to discarding the grounds in the portafilter. Would a blind shaker with a lid with a needle inside help this distribution? I think it would, maybe. I don't know. Um, which coffee tastes the closest to Crow? Asking for a friend. A baked past crop. Low water content Ethiopia coffee. What's your new go-to method? Maybe I have a video that I've already filmed. That is the conglomeration of all these past five science videos I've done to kind of showcase my approach to espresso, which actually hasn't really changed much since I've done these. A lot of them were already things I've, I've practiced. But, uh, you know, what I've done is I've, I made a video on how I approach espresso and uh, very self-indulgent, I know, but I thought it was the it was my kind of goal video after all these. So if you notice, there was obviously a trend in a lot of my recent videos. I did the Ross Droplet Technique video. I did puck screens. I did tampers. I did um, uh, distribution tool, and I did um, puck screen, tamper, distribution tool, RDT, baskets. I did, but that was a while ago. The baskets was a while ago, I know. But that that was, um, that's included in it. So those five videos and kind of put it together into my methodology when I'm pulling like a typical nine bar shot. It's hard to just completely cover espresso in general because the, the term espresso now has so many, so a multiplicity of definitions, like who knows? So I'm just kind of relegating it to a more standard style of shot um, and how I approach that, how I pull them, uh, what, what my process is. So that video is coming up, so look out for that. I wonder if any effect of shaking on releasing VOCs. That's a great question, something I've thought about quite a bit. But then you have to think about the fact that um, grinders, like when you think about the Legome P100 or, even, or the Niche, both of those, they grind and then they sit in the chamber and they spin for a long time foo, foo, at a pretty high temperature because it gets hot in there. And that is releasing a lot of VOCs. If it, So maybe this is superior enough that maybe we should look at uh, well, obviously, don't go buy a new grinder, but I'm saying uh, that's obviously harming VOCs as well. This is likely harming VOCs, but maybe that means that we need to look into grinders that don't harm them as bad so they get the grounds out as fast as possible so that this is not going to harm it as much. It's kind of like a game of checks and balances. Who really knows? I can't speak to it exactly. I'm sure any second that this is not tamped and pulling is harming VOCs. Now, whether or not the dissipation of them is more rapid due to the shaking, I would have to assume probably, but I can't speak to that. I also can't speak to the magnitude of the effect. Is it more important that we get the kind of clogging of those pores to allow a more even extraction? Uh, will that help flavor more than shaking for five seconds will harm flavor with VOC uh, loss? I don't know. So it's a good question, but it's like so much in in uh, out of knowledge. <laughs> You're not going to get in trouble. I'm hungry. Someone said you're not going to get in trouble. I've got to imagine they were doing Jack Black from School of Rock. Um, what was the vacuum used during testing? Hilarious. I've actually gotten this question like so many times because how powerful it is. And I'm going to be honest with you. It was a little cheapo I bought. Um, it was not expensive. It's just powerful as heck. It's called a Vosfeel. V-O-S-F-E-E-L. I don't know what it is, but this bad boy is a bad boy. Turbo mode. Look at that. Didn't know you were going to see that on camera. <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's a beast. But yeah, it cooled that, that chamber down so well. Like, it's kind of shocking. Um, let's see. 
Do you think a zero finds grinder could test the boulder theory? Potentially. I mean, I, there's no such thing as a zero finds grinder. That's literally impossible. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you have a funnel. Someone said, I have a funnel on my 54 millimeter Breville portafilter with my option over, and it works like a charm. And that makes complete sense. <laughs> Sorry. I just got a text message from Jonathan Gagne, who I guess is watching this right now. And uh, he, he jokingly said, as if you weren't getting enough crap for what you said about distribution, you now say Italian coffee sucks. LOL. I like uh, I like to torture myself, apparently. I'm a masochist. Um, that's pretty funny. Um, I, it's not that Italian coffee sucks. It's not, it's not, it's lower quality. Objectively, it is. It's objectively lower quality. It's not specialty in any of these cafes. Unless you go to specialty shop, that's a different, I'm not talking about specialty. Specialty coffee in Italy is beautiful. I love a lot of the shops there. Taste and uh, Gardelli and, uh, you know, uh, um, um, Dita. And I mean, there's so many, there's so many great ones. The, His Majesty, all these things. But um, yeah, anyway. Obviously, I love history from Italy. I'm obsessed with their friggin' espresso history, and I'll drink that stuff sometimes. Is it the best espresso I've had? No, it's not very good at all. I just, okay, I'm just digging my hole deeper. I'm going to stop. Um, let's see. How do you think blooming with flow control and something like an E61 machine would influence extraction? Blooming with a flow control machine. Oh, I mean, it, so I've showed this actually, instead of answering it, I'm going to push people watching this video to go watch my recent flow and pressure video, which is very good and talks about this exactly. Um, okay, let's see what time is it. All right, I got four more minutes. I'll answer like one or two more questions and then we'll, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to zip off and I'm going to have two more episodes of Breaking Bad. I've never seen the show before, but I have two more episodes and I'm done with the show. So a little insight into my life. I'm going to go finish that up. So, I mean, I won't, it is what it is. But um, so don't don't ruin it for me. Okay, guys? Don't ruin it. Um, someone just said that, you know, essentially they, they had asked on the decent form if, if time from grinding to pulling the shot makes a different in flavor. And people say it didn't. Uh, no, that's absolutely false. It absolutely does. And even in cupping, people are very aware of this. In cupping, whenever people do big, big, long uh, tables of cupping bowls, you'll, you'll put lids on them to kind of hold back as much of the air aroma as possible. And it's because it does evaporate quickly. You want to do it very quickly. That's why you don't want to pre-grind your espresso. That's why it's been absolutely, you know, crapped on, even though in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s and still in some shops around the world, people will pre-grind into those dosers and then dose it out pre-ground. That's just like staled out, essentially. You definitely don't want to pre-grind and let it just sit. <coughs> Curious to know why you went with flat nine bar till the end of the shot rather than going down to six bar. I did that because I think that A, it will show or expose more of the issues in the puck preparation then going down to six bar wood. And B, I don't remember if I said A or not, my brain's melting. And B, I did it because more people have the flat nine shot. So when I say flat nine, it's it's trying to stay at nine. Obviously it can't, and once it goes past a limit, I put a limit of five grams a second on there because that's a pretty common limit. Uh, so it wouldn't go over five grams a second flow rate coming out. Uh, so it would start to dip in pressure if you know there was an issue there. But uh, the idea is, if, you will more easily see issues in puck preparation when you have the puck eroding and more water splashing through it. The more evenly it is distributed, the less issues you're going to see later in the extraction with an increasing flow rate, uh, if that makes sense, right? The, if it were to reduce its pressure, even if there were some issues and problematic ones that could be exposed, they may not be exposed because it's lessening the pressure on the puck. Um. Oh, you're in time to see the stream, but you're about to miss it because I'm about to go off. I'm about to literally, we're at like a minute, 20 seconds. I was trying to make this like 45 minutes. Any news on that secret uh, project? No, uh, no news. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Mom is the word. And I want, that is a good thing to address. Someone was accusing me on Reddit of like trying to grow my brand by teasing this. I didn't even want to talk about it at all. But if I want to review a Breville product, I'm not going to without making sure people know there's a potential bias. And so I chatted with lawyers and I was like, 
I need to say something. What can I say? And that's what was kind of discovered to say is, you know, a secret project. And even though that's not an ideal thing to say, it was not an attempt at teasing an announcement. It was a, I want to review the Bambino Plus, but I don't want to do it without like being open and forthright about it. And if you noticed on my channel, I went like a year and a half without any Breville product. And it's because um, it, the, the, that whole time I wasn't working with them, but there was a time where I started and I was uncomfortable. And eventually I was like, okay, they have some new machines coming out. People are asking for reviews. I want to review them, but I need to make sure that I'm upfront and transparent because that's my brand. That's my brand. My brand is not teasing a stupid project. My brand is making sure I'm transparent as hell and letting people know there's a potential bias here. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I can't, I, I obviously that's all I can, I should probably shouldn't even said all that, but, um, yeah, so there, there's no, there's, it's just a thing that'll happen. Um, okay. Uh, would you ever film inside an espresso factory? Would be super curious to see a roller, a rolling mill grinder. Probably not. That's not my thing. I don't, I don't want to really give much attention to Nespresso and things like that because that's just not my thing. I, I want to be amenable to all coffee drinkers, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to be an enabler of Nespresso. I'm not a fan of Nestle. I don't like, um, that style of coffee. I just, I don't want to just do all things coffee, to be honest with you. Um, like I'm not going to do. I'm not, you know, they're, they're like, I, 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 I am not James Hoffman. We're very different people, right? James really enjoys doing very entertaining things. He, and he, he's very scientific as well. He's very brilliant. I love James. He's seriously one of the smartest people I know. Um, I love that guy. Uh, but he enjoys tasting a hundred coffee creamers and tasting instant coffees and doing Nespresso videos, tasting the capsules and all that stuff. That's not, I don't, I don't want to do that. That's, I, I have zero interest in doing that. Um, at all. Like, I just don't, I just don't want to. Um, yeah. So that's, that's about it. Um, that's about it with that. I think, I think he does an awesome job with it. I'll let him, I'll let him continue to carry that torch. Uh, and he may do that at some point. Now, as far as roller mills, you don't have to go to a Nespresso to see that. Um, like I, Comatier, who he went out to see actually at the same time, it invited me to come up, but I just couldn't, I was planning for a move, but, um, to Portugal, but uh, I may go to Comatier at some point to, to do something with their roller mill, but you can't, they don't let you see it. So maybe um, I think there's someone in Portugal that has one that I could probably go look at, but um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not raring at the opportunity to go and see a pod factory. Um, any idea when the DF83V review will be up? Uh, it's just DF83V, not V3. It's just DF83V, variable speed. Uh, no, but uh, probably a couple months. Yeah, but anyway, all right, so that's it. I went a few minutes over, but thank you so much for all the support. Um, I've been working my butt off because honestly, I know, like, I'm, no, I'm not an idiot. I understand the influence I have been gaining when it comes to the market, and I don't mean to uh, abuse that power in any way. Um, it is difficult, obviously, because when I say something like when I'm presenting this data, immediately, you know, like the Weber shaker sold out. And that's not my intention at all. Um, I understand, though, the I understand the thought process behind it. And I would probably do the same, honestly. And so, um, but, I, you know, it's one of these things where I'm trying to learn how to how to handle it and how to progress. Um, you know, there's probably going to be mistakes made and there's going to be um, my foot in my mouth a few times. But that's the name of the game. Right. Anyway. Uh, I, I appreciate you all so much. Everyone who's watching this channel, uh, you are the true nerds, the true uh, goats. You are the loves of my life. You you, you make it a lot, a lot more fun. I'm so glad I started uh, this Patreon, this second channel, and and have a little community on Discord. It's it's a lot of fun. And um, yeah, thanks for indulging me. Um, let's get back to Discord and chat. But to any, anyone else who's watching this video, they are live for Patreon members. Um, I post the link before I go live and they, they have access to live chats. Um, so you're in chat with them as you saw and uh, post it up later on here and on podcast so that people can kind of still have access to it. But to have the live access, obviously uh, it's the, the, the Patreon thing. But uh, if, if you this is your first video of mine somehow, you should check out my main channel, which is linked below. And uh, I think that's about it. Thank you for watching. I hope you all have a great day, morning, evening, whatever it is in your part of the world. But that's about it. I hope you brew something tasty today or tomorrow. And cheers. Now the awkward time of me ending the stream. <laughs>